Icons were everywhere in the 1980s. Freddy, Jason, Michael, Superman and Batman, Schwarzenegger and Stallone. The rise, fall and rise again of horror. Just when you thought it was dead, it rises like a phoenix. Like the characters, it will never die. Big American business that was sold and enjoyed across the globe. In 1987, a new icon was born. Not from urban America, but from the heart of England. It became a real game changer and stretched the limits of the imagination. Clive Barker's Hellraiser. This is it. Let me no, see. don't touch it. It's dangerous. It opens doors. What kind of doors? Doors to the pleasures of heaven or hell. I didn't care which. I thought I'd gone to the limits. I hadn't. The Cenobites gave me an experience beyond the limits. Here in the UK, we had a long and prosperous history of horror. Hammer carried the flag for many, many years until it fizzled out in the late 70s. Out of the ashes came Clive Barker and his novel, The Hellbound Heart, the tale of a puzzle box. It's dark secrets that reveal pain and pleasure to those curious souls, but it's acquired by a sadistic man looking to feed his lust. But he gets more than he bargained for from the guardians of the box led by a hell priest with pins in his head. The theme of sadomasochism taken from experiences in Barker's younger life in New York City. Hellraiser was his first experience as a director and while he was unprepared, it was a great experience. He cast his old schoolmate, Doug Bradley, who became the face of the movie. The box. You opened it. We came. It's just a puzzle box! Oh no. It is a means to summon us. Who are you? Explorers in the further regions of experience. Demons to some. Angels to others. It was a mistake! Two Americans were cast. Andy Robinson, who previously played Scorpio in the first Dirty Harry movie and would later become a Star Trek legend as Deep Space Nine's Cardassian Taylor Garrick. Ashley Lawrence, who would become one of horror's most popular final girls. Many of the cast members, British in nationality, had their voices dubbed over by Americans. This is a typical thing back then. Many American movies like Star Wars and Superman that were shot at Shepperton and Pinewood Studios that used local talent did the same, though it feels like a, a tedious issue given their status now. This came about due to the studio New World Pictures wanted to change its location after shooting, but you can't contextually take London out of the picture. This is a raw and brutal horror movie made by us that stands with other infamous fare from Wes Craven's Last House on the Left and Takashi Miike's Itchy the Killer. Of course, its brutality didn't go unnoticed by the censors. Julia hammering victims and Frank having his way thereafter. Their flashback sex scene, Frank being torn apart at the end ended up on the cutting room floor in America and Britain until around 2000. One final point, that those of you out there who think gay people cannot make a good horror movie, Clive Barker is gay. He wrote The Hellbound Heart. He made this, his gift to us, his masterpiece. One of the darkest of dark fairy tales. <laughs> Frank. No. We had to hear it from your own lips. This 
isn't for your eyes. You set me up, bitch. Right, I had this finished, but unfortunately, like previous videos in this series, there were things that came to mind that I forgot to put in them. Which is one of the reasons I call this the Autistic Nebula. So I'm putting this in at the end. I'm leaving the final cut. I'm leaving, I'm, I'm putting this at the end as an addendum. I never mentioned sequels. I was just so fixed on talking about the original. I remember watching the first three when I was a teenager and loving them, but I have an issue. The first is Barker's. The second carries Barker's spirit. But the third is an Americanized edition. Even though we get a new generation of Cenobites, it's the juxtaposition between Elliot and Pinhead. Juxtaposition between or juxtaposition of. Ah, you, you decide. This could have been something else, something more. I know they had to do something. There was a feeling of sophistication in Pinhead in his first two appearances. But in the third movie, he just comes across cold. Fun, but still quite cold. He's just not the angel of hell anymore. That's my gripe. It's funny here. I had forgotten that there was a Star Trek link. Andy Robinson, who was in the first. Terry Farrell, who was in the third. Deep Space Nine. You've got Garrick and you've got Jadzia Dax. I haven't seen past the first three and I don't feel like I need to at this point. Oh yeah, do check out the Leviathan documentary. It makes for a great companion piece. You can find it on Blu-ray from Arrow Video. They've split the two parts onto the first two movies. So you get the first on the first movie, the second on the second movie. It's a very long documentary and it goes into so much I heartily recommend it. The team that made it have made other really great documentaries. Your So Called Brewster, The Story of Fright Night. There's a new one out. It's already on YouTube, looking at the, the story of the 1990 version of Stephen King's It. It will be coming out in physical media of uh, two, three weeks time. Which brings me to the new movie. I am loving the new puzzle box. <laughs> and dear Jamie Clayton, she was so fucking awesome in Sensei. She looks fantastic. Fantastic in this. Two more, and he is yours. Feed it. Their pain. Their blood. Unlock the next configuration. I've also seen the backlash, the transphobic and the homophobic rhetoric. Now let me make myself clear. Attacking a trans woman for playing a legend that was originally written by a gay guy does not make you the better person. What it does show is that you're exposing yourself to everybody, your impetuously insecure attitudes. You sound like a collapsing lung. You put all your energy into breathing your opinion, but it will all come to naught. Don't like it? Don't bother commenting. Go fuck yourself. At least that's what you're best at. <laughs>